This is an NBC News special report, the tragedy of Challenger 7. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers and overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes. Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe. We mourn their loss as a nation together. Good evening. I'm Tom Brokaw, NBC News in Washington. We have all seen those pictures so many times today, and the ending is always the same. The sickening, shocking realization that no one on board the shuttle Challenger could possibly have survived such a terrible explosion. And one of those on board was the schoolteacher, Krista McAuliffe, the mother of two, chosen to represent all the nation's educators. Surely nothing would go wrong with her on board, but it did. The shuttle was about a minute and a half into its launch in this position. It was being pushed along at about three times the speed of sound when the crew was told to push the main engines, which are located back here at the back of the shuttle, to full throttle. They're fueled by a half million gallons of liquid oxygen and hydrogen in this huge 15-story exterior or external tank. And at one point, it appeared to erupt. We're going to show you now some computer-enhanced pictures. We're going to show you just what, in fact, happened. NBC News graphics using sophisticated computer techniques has captured what, in fact, happened. A terrible explosion, one scientist equating it to the charge of a small nuclear bomb. On the left, you can spot a burst of flame appearing to be in the vicinity of the left side solid rocket containing a million pounds of thrust. In a microsecond, a burst on the right, growing more evident on the left. Now both trouble spots plainly visible. Disaster measured in milliseconds. These computer-enhanced pictures eliminate most of the smoke that would otherwise obscure our vision. In the twinkling of an eye, it may be pictures like this that may eventually tell us why and what happened. But for now, it does appear that the big external tank did explode, although we will not know for sure until NASA completes a thorough and exhausting examination and investigation. NBC Steve Delaney was at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida this morning when the shuttle was launched on its short flight to death. Tom, I think the next thing we're going to learn from what happened today is is when the uh, NASA people begin to put together their board of inquiry, which will begin the process, a tedious process, of trying to assemble enough data to come to a, a conclusion on, on what caused it all. That board of inquiry was promised a little earlier today by NASA's uh, Associate Administrator for Manned Spaceflight. And it also fell to a rather stricken looking uh, Jess Moore to talk about what everybody already suspected. The space program experienced a national tragedy with the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger approximately a minute and a half after launch from here at the Kennedy Space Center. I regret that I have to report that based on very preliminary searches of the ocean where the Challenger impacted this morning, these searches have not revealed any evidence that the crew of Challenger survived. Moore also refused to be drawn into speculation that the television pictures might provide an answer. We will not speculate as to the specific cause of the explosion based on that footage. It will take all the data, careful review of that data, before we can draw any conclusions on this national tragedy. Tom, the data is already beginning to come in. They are collecting bits and pieces out at sea even this evening. They are impounding all kinds of records that were kept by the controllers at their various consoles, and they are naming specialists of various kinds of disciplines to look over all the available indicators to see if they can figure out what happened and why and where do we go from here. But that's going to be a terribly long process, 
one that will not satisfy the national need for a quick answer. There just doesn't seem to be one at this point. Steve Delaney at the Kennedy Space Center at uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida tonight. NBC's Dan Molina, who covers the shuttle program for us, was at the Johnson Space Center, that's in Houston, Texas, when the awful realization swept through the control center there. Dan, you're there with a model like the one I showed just a few moments ago. The fact is that the space shuttle is launched effectively on a large Roman candle with all kinds of thrust and all kinds of potential for difficulty going on within it, more than a million parts altogether. Yes, that's very true, Tom. It's well to remember that when we talk about the space shuttle, we're talking about the most complex machine that man has ever devised. And it takes a great deal of thrust, as you say, to get the shuttle up into orbit. It takes the huge external tank, Tom. As you said, it's full of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Now, there's actually three tanks inside of the large external tank. On the top, is the liquid oxygen. In the middle, there is sort of a connecting tank between the two, an inner tank, they call it. On the bottom is the uh, liquid uh, hydrogen. Now, there was some speculation earlier on that perhaps there may have been a rupture in one of the bulkheads that separates the liquid oxygen from the liquid hydrogen. Nobody is saying that officially or unofficially, but it's one of the theories that's floating around right now. The orbiter itself mounted on the outside of that. This, of course, the crew compartment, all of them in here at uh, Right underneath the, uh, here is one of the points where, as you say on that computer-enhanced graphics, we could see one of the explosions. It was interesting, and again, when we talk about theories, we must emphasize that they are theories, nothing more at this point, nothing official. But that's one of the points right here where the external tank is connected to the orbiter. There's another point down here. Now, they, in, the, uh, in the sequence of launch, that, uh, that external tank is separated by exploding bolts and there was some speculation that perhaps one of the bolts had exploded prematurely it almost seemed like the uh the uh explosion once starting here kind of snaked its way upward but that again is all speculation at this point the numbers tom the numbers the sheer numbers of the volume of thrust that's produced here gives you some idea they're so incomprehensible each of the three main engines that you pointed out earlier 375,000 pounds of, of thrust apiece. The solid rocket boosters, 2,900,000 pounds of thrust. It's an enormous, almost incomprehensible amount of power that's underneath the orbiter as it's going up, and the potential for things happening unexpectedly is, of course, always there, Tom. And, of course, there's nothing like a small explosion when uh, that begins to go off, as it apparently did happen today, about uh, five miles up in space. This shuttle is the pride and joy of the Rockwell Corporation, which is located in California. NBC's George Lewis was there today to hear what Rockwell scientists were saying and speculating about. This headline greeted the people who make the shuttle orbiter as they left work this afternoon. But most of the employees at the Rockwell Aerospace plant had already seen the disaster replayed and replayed on television. The company had cautioned employees not to talk to reporters. But some could not contain themselves. This loss was too close, too personal, and the reactions were strong. Mine was numbness, some ladies were crying. You know, not necessarily because a billion dollars worth of equipment is gone forever, but seven really brilliant and beautiful people got killed. William Roberts, an engineer on the shuttle program since 1973, openly speculated about the cause of the blast. We had a catastrophic failure of the tank. That's from what I've been viewing of the uh, television films. And when you have that happen, the two liquids, the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen, they become quite an explosive mixture. The shuttle's external fuel tank at the top in this picture appears to burst into flame at two different places. Some experts believe a spinning turbine blade from one of the shuttle's booster rockets could have broken loose, piercing the tank. Engineer Roberts. You could have had an extreme uh, pressure differential and the common bulkhead could have failed. And if that fails, you have exactly what you see here. It could, all the fuel could have mixed together. The Rockwell engineers could not leave the tragedy even when they got home. Stan Yoshino and his wife Dottie were close friends of one of the astronauts who died, Ellison Onizuka. We used to talk about it, and I said, God, Allison, there's so many things that could go wrong. And he said, yes, Stan, I know that. So many things that could go wrong. Now the people who built the shuttle, people who feel a personal responsibility for the astronauts who ride aboard it, will be asked to take part in the investigation into exactly what did go wrong 
and why. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. We want to talk about all of this further tonight with an assembled group of space experts with me in Washington now is Florida Congressman Bill Nelson, who recently completed a shuttle flight. And in New York tonight, former Apollo astronaut David Scott, who's now president of our rocket company. In Houston, Alan Bean, a man who walked on the moon and helped train the NASA astronauts who are there today. And he's there with Gerald Griffin, former director of the Johnson Space Center. And in San Diego tonight, one of the original members of the astronaut corps, Wally Shira. We want to talk, first of all, with... Uh, Congressman Nelson, it was just two weeks ago that you lifted off. Do you think that we have oversold this space program and the space shuttle program in terms of what it can do? Because this was such a shock to so many people. Uh, of course it was a shock. It was a shock to all of us. Uh, no, we haven't oversold it. Uh, we've had some 24 exceptionally successful flights. And the, uh, the system works well. Obviously, there was a major malfunction that is tragedy today. Uh, we'll find out what the problem is, and we'll fix it. And the space shuttle will continue to be America's way to go into space and return. It's important to the future of this country. But when you went for that ride two weeks ago, were you forewarned by NASA that something like this could happen? You know that there's a risk involved. But this is a calamity of a magnitude that no one anticipated. Every member of the crew understands there's a risk. You don't expect that this kind of tragedy is going to occur. We had a malfunction right after we cleared the tower. And immediately, our pilot, Charlie Bolden, jumped on it, corrected the malfunction, and you know the perfection of our mission. Uh, that was not to be today. David Scott in uh, New York, you're now president of our rocket company, do you think that we've got too much invested in the uh, manned space shuttle program? A lot of people are talking today about the use of unmanned vehicles just to launch satellites and other things. Is that a better way for us to go in the future? Well, I think, Tom, there must be a balance between the manned and the unmanned programs. I think each has its role to play. But in general, I believe we can proceed further into the exploration and utilization of space with manned programs because of man's natural ability to judge things, evaluate things, and use his mind as a computer. But there are roles for both manned and unmanned vehicles. And Wally Shira in San Diego, as you watched all of this unfold today, as you've been there since day one, what was your reaction to what you saw? Tom, when I first saw it, when I first saw it, I was quite surprised. I hear you fine. Who, who's cutting in? Why don't you just keep on talking to me, Wally, and ignore that other voice if you can. <laughs> Hello, Tom. I'm kind of warm out here in California. Right. The uh, Bob Bell isn't working too well for us, but the, the shock I had this morning was seeing not instant replay, but almost instant, of debris coming down, and I began to think, my God, it finally happened. After 25 years, we lucked out that long. The statistics finally caught up to us. Of course, we, we felt that this could happen to us any time. But we decided it shouldn't happen, and we changed the name from rocket to booster, assuming that it would be safer that way. But I can recall going through Mercury and Gemini with what were rockets, and finally fly, flying on that Apollo with a man-made rocket or a man-made booster, which is what we saw today. It just turns out that eventually we're going to find something going wrong. All right, uh, Mr. Scott, Mr. Shira, you're both uh, highly trained astronauts. What about the idea of putting a civilian in space? And then we'll get Bill Nelson's reaction to that as well. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, I, I think that uh, naturally civilians have a role in space because the civilians have roles everywhere. And as we expand into space, explore the universe, and conduct our science, uh, I think we can't limit that just to the military. Although, as you well know, the military also has a role in space. And what about you, uh, Wally? Do you think that we should continue to put civilians in space? Well, of course, Tom. It's, it's like an airplane. We We've had some horrible accidents in the calendar year 85 with aircraft, and anything you do is high risk. When we think of gasoline that we carry in an automobile, that, that could be a bomb, too, if it's hit the wrong way. So it's a case of just realizing that what we do when we move around is very high risk. And Mr. Griffin at uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston tonight, this is going to be a terrible setback for NASA, isn't it? Well, obviously, Tom, it's a, it's a great personal loss for many of us, and it's also a, a situation that we've got to understand and correct. Uh, anytime you have something like this, it, I'd have to call it a setback, but we've had them before, and it, we're at the point now where, where we've got to get on and understand this problem and correct it, and I think we can come back from it. Do you think it's a good idea to continue the civilian and space program? 
Well, yes, I think you've got to take a step back. And today we are worried about the events of today and, and mostly yesterday and tomorrow. But as you really think about what we're trying to do in space, it's not just to put people into orbit in the shuttle. We are literally trying to build a whole infrastructure ultimately that will allow us to completely expand and, and take full advantage of this rather new ocean that we uh, have spent 25 years getting to the point where we are today. As part of that, obviously, uh, civilians uh, of all walks of life will, I think, will ultimately inhabit that infrastructure. And there's no time better than today to begin that. Congressman Nelson, I know that the space shuttle program is important to you personally and to your district as well, but we do have an enormous investment in that single program. Wouldn't it be a better idea for the United States to spread it out a little bit, to have more unmanned rockets, for example, in addition to the shuttle program? We've got so much invested in the shuttle itself. Well, we do have investments. Uh, the Air Force continues to have an expendable launch vehicle, and they're planning that through the next decade. But we developed the shuttle to be America's space transportation system, and there's no reason that it can't continue to be once we find out what was the cause of this tragedy. Uh, I think that we'll find the problem, we'll correct the problem, and then we'll go on from there. All right, Congressman Nelson, thank you very much. Mr. Griffin in Houston tonight in uh, New York. Mr. Scott in San Diego, Wally Shira. This has been, a, I know, a personal tragedy for all of you because you've all been involved in the program. Tonight, some of the shuttle's heat-resistant tiles are washing up and they're being collected by people on the Florida coastline near Cape Canaveral. Those are the small tiles that we've made so much of over the years of the shuttle program. They protect it once it begins to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. The search for debris from the explosion is continuing tonight in other parts of the Atlantic in an area that is 60 miles wide and 120 miles long. And NBC's David Hazinski reports on that development. Pieces of debris that have been recovered so far are being brought to the air base at Cape Canaveral where they'll be examined later. The explosion that blew apart Challenger spread debris over a wide area. Ten aircraft searched a 1,200 mile grid into the night and will go out again at first light tomorrow. At least 11 ships, including NASA, Coast Guard and Navy vessels are continuing the search for wreckage overnight. NASA has warned commercial fishing and private boaters to leave alone any wreckage they find and just report it to authorities. A NASA spokesman says it's critical that the wreckage not be disturbed and warned that some of it could be dangerous. There were explosives aboard the shuttle, uh, the solid rocket boosters. There was also toxic chemicals, uh, hydrogen tetroxide, uh, other acids, uh, hydrazine, uh, which are all very, very toxic. Ocean depth at the crash point is only between 100 and 200 feet deep. NASA is expected to talk to the Navy tomorrow about bringing in divers or subs to recover any sunken wreckage that it finds. David Hazinski, NBC News at the Kennedy Space Center. The official investigation into what went wrong today could take months. More about that now from NBC News science correspondent Robert Bazell, who has covered the space shuttle since it began. He's at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena tonight. Bob, we've already heard from Jess Moore that they're impounding even the notes of the people who were involved today, the technicians, and it looks like they're going to get the tapes and all the other telemetry as well, and it could be some time before we know anything. Wouldn't you agree? Well, it's a very difficult task. It's what engineers call failure analysis. They have to, if they possibly can, to recreate the incident, either in a laboratory or some kind of model so that they understand exactly what went wrong. Because until that happens, it's, it's very clear that the shuttle can't fly again, and that's a, that's a necessary aspect to this investigation. Now, there, there are several lines of, of, of inquiry going on. They will study models of the rockets, they'll study every bit of data, every bit of voice communication, anything that could have gone on in the maintenance, anything that may have been seen by anybody during the entire uh, process leading up to the launch and in the, that first minute and 15 seconds before the tragedy. It will take a long time. One of the crucial elements, as David Hazinski just pointed out, will be reassembling whatever debris is found in, in an Air Force Base locker down there in, in, in Florida. All of anything could have could yield a clue. At this point, there are several hypotheses, and the, the one that we have heard mentioned the most often is that a piece of a fan in one of the main engines broke apart that flew through uh, 
the edge of the main engine and then went into that external fuel tank, causing the external fuel tank to rupture and become a bomb. That's only a hypothesis. That's the one that we've heard the most often today, but it's going to take a lot of investigation until they find out exactly what went wrong. Well, let's go over a couple of things that we do know, Bob. First of all, everything seemed very normal right up to the moment of explosion. In fact, it was so normal that as you heard the NASA commentator, he continued to talk about what he was seeing in his own telemetry. By then, the explosion had already occurred. The second point is, it appeared to me that the explosion was so thorough, so complete, that there's a good chance that that debris is so small and so shattered that they won't learn anything from it. Is that realistic? Well, that certainly is. I mean, the NASA commentator, who is a public affairs officer, was looking at a different screen from his television screen, and it continued to tell him how far downrange it was. That was why he kept talking like that. It certainly is possible that it blew the whole thing apart in such a way that no clues will be found. But that's there is a lot of data that comes down be besides the astronauts' voices, uh, indicating the performance of each of the engines, uh, the three main engines and the two solid rocket boosters that were going at that time, uh, all the guidance systems and everything else on board. If there was any anomaly at all, anything at all went wrong, it should have shown up at that point. Uh, it wasn't hit by a foreign object. That was very clear. It was an explosion that occurred on board. Now, there are other areas to look at as well that, that might be considered, and this was uh, something that we, we talked about before. There are explosive bolts all over and, and other kinds of explosive devices all over the shuttle. Explosive bolts that are designed uh, to send off the solid rocket boosters at two minutes into the flight. Explosive bolts to jettison the external fuel tank. If one of those had gone off prematurely, uh, that certainly would have caused an explosion. But there's all kinds of redundancy and safety devices supposedly to present, prevent that from happening, but obviously something went wrong, and that's what they have to find out. Robert Brazell of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena tonight, where he has been covering the flight of the Voyager spacecraft. That was a spacecraft flight of triumph, of course, sending back pictures from Uranus of those remarkable moons that we've all been seeing. Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher who was selected for more than 11,000 educators who wanted to fly in space, was easily the best known of the astronauts who died today. But the other six are not to be forgotten either. NBC's Tom Pettit tonight on this tragic loss of bright, dedicated people. The crew of Challenger was distinguished, some more famous than others, but truly all American. I'm joined here at the Cape by astronaut Dick Scobie, who is to pilot the mission of STS-13, and our science correspondent Bob Bazaar. Dick Scobie, the pilot, had appeared on the Today Show during a launch in 1983. He was 46. And I'm sure there'll be some problems to take care of along, along the way, which will be a challenge, and, uh, and be able to come back and, and, and say, I've done it, and hopefully go do it again uh, quite a few times. Smith was the co-pilot. He was 40. Judith Resnick. America's second woman in space and the first Jewish woman. And she was a TV expert on the Today Show. And we get to do a little bit of everything in state of the art, and it's always a challenge. She was 36. Krista McAuliffe was a high school teacher in Concord, New Hampshire. Her selection to be the first teacher in space had overshadowed the flight itself. She was 38. I just took that chance, along with 11,000 other people, that it will give them maybe the inspiration to try something new and to take a chance. 11,000 other American teachers have lost out to her in the competition to be the first teacher in space. Ronald McNair, Ph.D. in physics from MIT. McNair was the second black to have been in space, going for his second trip today. You know, that wasn't the kind of thing a black kid thought about. You know, how do you get to do something like that? What do you do? And uh, it's, I pursued science with that in my mind, and uh, it wasn't until recently that I saw a break to make a dream, you know, come true. He was 35. Ellison Onizuka was 39. He was a Japanese-American from Hawaii. This would have been his second flight. He liked space work. It's great. Uh, what a way to live. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force. The seventh crew member, Gregory Jarvis, engineer. Jarvis had been bumped from two previous flights to make room for politicians. Today was to have been his day. Uh, I've been charged up since uh, last March, and so this is kind of a culmination of a dream come true. It was an all-American crew. Tom Pettit, NBC News, New York. Today's shuttle mission had special meaning for teachers everywhere, of course, and the launch was watched in many classrooms across the country by students of all ages. One of those was the Centerville, Ohio classroom of James Rowley, who was the runner-up in NASA's search for the teacher astronaut. 
Also in that classroom today was Mike Conway of NBC affiliate WKEF in Dayton, Ohio. It's lunch hour for these Centerville High School students, but they wanted to be in class, to be with science teacher Jim Raleigh. The students knew what the shuttle launch meant to him. Raleigh was one of the semi-finalists for the teacher in space flight. Besides being on the flight, Raleigh said the best place to be was with his students, helping them understand this historic flight of the Challenger. The main engines are on. Four, three, two, one. The interest soon turned to bewilderment. For a few minutes, even Raleigh didn't understand what was happening. Well, about 45 seconds after liftoff, a huge fireball. I don't understand. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. My director confirmed that we are looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Can we, can we get the cameras? The reaction of all of us across the country today when we realized that this was no longer science fiction, that we were dealing with reality. For President Reagan, this was to have been an upbeat evening. Mr. Reagan had planned to set out his agenda for the coming year in his State of the Union address to a joint session of Congress and the nation tonight. But that speech, understandably, was postponed. The president telling the nation instead that this was a day for mourning and for remembering. NBC's Chris Wallace followed today's events at the White House. Chris? Tonight, the flag above the White House was lowered to half-staff, the president ordering a similar show of respect at all government installations. In a speech to the nation, Mr. Reagan called the accident a national loss and spoke directly to the school children who had watched it. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The president had embraced the space program in part to blunt questions of his age, to show he was future-oriented. He proposed a teacher in space in his re-election campaign. And despite today's tragedy, he said the shuttle program will go on. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Mr. Reagan was to make his State of the Union speech tonight and planned to go ahead even after the accident, saying you can't stop governing the nation. But the speech was postponed for a week after congressional leaders said there was no interest in politics tonight. And the fact is the president was as powerless as everyone else today. A spokesman said Mr. Reagan was informed of the accident by the vice president and, like everyone else, rushed to a TV set. Quite frankly, the president was stood there in almost stunned silence as he watched the television. Uh, you, could, uh, you could certainly read uh, the concern, uh, the sorrow, uh, the anxiety uh, on his face as he watched uh, and the group watched around him. Like today, the president still had no answers, but had found words to remember the shuttle crew. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Tomorrow, the president will perform one of the toughest parts of his job, calling the relatives of those who died on the shuttle. And later this week, he plans to attend a memorial service organized by NASA. Tom? Is there any talk at the White House tonight of making extraordinary efforts on the part of this administration to reach out to teachers in the country and to school children as well? I was struck by the fact that the president made a special appeal to students tonight in his address and also when Vice President George Bush arrived at the Kennedy Space Center today as the official representative of the president, he also spoke to the children of the country. Obviously the White House is worried about the traumatic effect that this could have on kids across the country. Uh, are they uh, planning anything beyond what we heard today, Chris, that you know about? Well, nothing specific that we've heard of, but I know that the president takes his role almost as national father very seriously, that he was shaken as he watched on TV, as all the rest of us did today, and he kept talking in, in a brief conversation with reporters about how terrible it must have been for the relatives, both children and adults, who had gone to the Cape to share in all the excitement and instead had been eyewitnesses to a terrible personal tragedy. I know that when those young servicemen died in the plane crash in Gander, he felt very strongly about going to Kentucky to a memorial service and meeting personally with all of the relatives there. And I'm sure he plans to do the same 
with certainly the relatives uh, at a memorial service organized by NASA and in any way he can to, to ease the pain and to gain some, some understanding in all this, not only for the school children, but for all of us. And are any of the aides at the White House tonight talking about the wisdom of the civilian and space program? It was the president's idea to put a teacher in space after all. A lot of cynics at the time thought it was just a, if you will, an election year gimmick to pick a teacher who happened to be a woman, who happened to be from New Hampshire, to go into space. And now, of course, we've had this tragic loss. There's already a program in effect for journalists to go in space as well. Are they having second thoughts about all that at the White House, Chris? They certainly are sad, and they certainly, you know, a lot of these people had personally met Krista McAuliffe in the Roosevelt Room, right across from the Oval Office. Just last July, she had been selected as the teacher in space, and many of them had met her. But I don't think there are any second thoughts. One of the points that the president made over and over again today was that space is the safest form of travel ever known to man. There had been 56 manned space flights in the American program. This is the first time that during a flight anyone had been lost. He and his top aides are all determined that nothing in this one accident be allowed to kill the space program. It's worth pointing out that Senator Jake Garn of uh, Utah, who was a, a, a veteran of the space shuttle program as well as one of the politicians in space, pointed out today that very statistic that you just talked about and said each year 50,000 people are killed on the nation's highways, about half of them by drunk drivers, and we ought to be more exercised about that. Two NBC veterans of the exploration of space from its beginnings are NBC's Roy Neal and Jay Barbary. They have been covering this story now for more than a quarter of a century, but they've never seen a darker day than this one. Jay, as you can see, is at Cape Canaveral tonight, where he is always posted, and Roy Neal is at Pasadena at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory there. Roy, let's begin with you. Nineteen years ago yesterday, at Cape Canaveral, the other deaths that were involved in the space program on the launch pad, Apollo 1, in the capsule, astronauts Chafee, Grissom, and White. What are your recollections about what happened that day and how they compare with today? Well, the biggest recollection I have, Tom, is to relate that fire, which it was, in a pure oxygen environment, to what happened today and to say there's no comparison, no basis for comparison. That particular tragedy called for a total realignment of the Apollo spacecraft, which was done, and about two and a half years later, men were flying to the moon in the new changed spacecraft. Today, by comparison, this thing came on unexpectedly. The telemetry, I am told, coming back from the spacecraft was fine. Everything seemed to be working perfectly, and then suddenly, without warning, not even warning to the computers on board, which would have aborted the mission and perhaps even given the astronauts a fighting chance for their lives, no warning at all, suddenly there was an explosion. That's the big difference between that unexpected occurrence, which was, of course, a terrible tragedy in its time, but called for a recreation of the program, and the one today, which probably will call for a recreation of the program, but for different reasons. And Jay Barbary in uh, Cape Canaveral tonight, are you hearing anything at all from the NASA officials who are down there and the workers that you know so well, or are they absolutely mum on the, on the situation? Well, what we know tonight, Tom, is that already Jess Moore, who is, who is the Associate Administrator of Manned Space Flight for NASA, is heading an interim uh, board. They're studying the data. What they have done, they have impounded everything, all the notes, anything that took place in the preparation of this mission. And they will appoint a board later after they have everything under control. And, of course, no shuttle will fly until the reason for this tragedy is known. And tomorrow we do expect that we will have another news conference in the afternoon and perhaps learn a little bit more about what is taking place and what is known at this early date. Uh, Jay, were you in your customary post uh, back there tucked alongside the NBC booth watching uh, the space shuttle with uh, your very good eyesight and describing it on radio at the time that it happened? Yes, uh, we weren't on live because, as people have pointed out, Tom, uh, we've gotten a little blasé about this, but I was watching it. And there for a moment as it climbed up into this dark blue sky, I had suddenly had the feeling that something was going to happen. And I was watching real close, and it did. And I knew when it happened what had happened. I saw the boosters, as everyone did, uh, spiraling away, spinning madly. And I stood there watching for Challenger to reappear. I kept looking for Challenger and the crew, and, Tom, it never came back. It was all in that fire. This kind of moment has been at the back of the minds of all of us who have covered the space program since its inception. But we really never expected it to happen, did we, Jay? 
No, we sure didn't. We expected it back in the days of Mercury and possibly Gemini. We expected it when John Glenn, they, they thought in Mercury Control that his heat shield had come off. We also had a near tragedy when Liberty Bell 7 was lost and uh, Gus Grissom had to swim for his life uh, just a hundred miles downrange from here. And then, of course, there was the Apollo 13 where the nation held its breath for four days. But we had gotten to the point with... 24 successful shuttle missions that we thought the computers, I suppose, Tom, would take care of everything. Well, today they didn't. And Roy Neal, the scientist and your contacts in NASA that you have talked to today, are they shocked? Are they being realistic about the possibility that this could have happened and it was going to happen sooner or later anyway? How are they feeling? Well, first, Tom, they are shocked. They are mystified. And to them, this was something in many cases, uh, particularly on the engineering rather than the science level, this was something that was indeed expected. They kept waiting for the axe to fall. And indeed, we at NBC, for example, in every case at every liftoff and at every landing, have had the equipment standing by just in case. Always lurking in the back of our minds has been the thought that this is not the safe business. And of course, we have the parallel of commercial aviation, or if you will, the President of the United States. We even cover his aircraft when it takes off and when it lands. Thank you very much, Roy Neal and Pasadena tonight, Jay Barbary at Cape Canaveral. For almost 20 years now, the space program has moved along without a loss of life, although by no means without problems. Tonight, NBC's Robert Hager looks into NASA's troubles and its prospects now for the future. The shuttle program had already been troubled by mechanical failures, cameras that wouldn't work, satellites which were supposed to spin into orbit but didn't, and delays which had threatened to cut back the 15 missions that had been planned for this year. Another big NASA project to put a permanent space station in orbit, a place astronauts could shuttle to and from, that plan had run into problems and had been pushed back perhaps to the late 1990s. A planned unmanned mission to get a closer look at Halley's Comet was scrapped completely. Not enough money. There have been other criticisms. For instance, that the military was moving in on NASA, taking over more and more of the civilian space program, changing NASA's traditional role. Even at the top of the agency, there's NASA been trouble. Administrator James Beggs forced last month to take a leave of absence, indicted on a charge of defrauding the government when he was an executive at General Dynamics some years ago. NASA's current acting administrator, William Graham, brand new on the job in the midst of this crisis. But NASA has survived previous problems, from the earliest days of the unmanned rocket tests through the drastic fire 19 years ago yesterday aboard Apollo 1, on the launch pad at then Cape Kennedy, taking the lives of Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Robert Chaffee. So today there were promises to keep going. Test pilot Chuck Yeager. When you have an accident like this, it doesn't mean the end of everything. I mean, you've got to fall back and take a look at it. But the main thing is that you've got to analyze the data and find out what caused the accident, then make your, take your corrective action. At the Cape, Vice President Bush. We must never as people in our daily lives or as a nation, stop exploring, stop hoping, stop discovering. We must press on. Obviously, NASA will carry on. But tonight, many here are saying that each time the agency needs to ask for more money, people, or equipment, they may be harder to come by now. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. The nation's space program is, of course, tremendously expensive. It is supported by the taxpayers, and it exists only at the discretion of Congress. But NBC's John Dancy has found considerable support in Congress, even in these difficult times, for the continuation of the program, despite the enormity of today's tragedy. Tom, Congress has shown tremendous support for the space program. It has a budget of about $7.5 billion, even at a time when other programs are being cut. But today, Congress was stunned. We ought to uh, take a deep breath and uh, step back uh, before we go ahead with uh, any further uh, manned flights. And it's my opinion that we should lessen the emphasis on civilian involvement now because of the danger. And NASA now has to find uh, a billion plus, close to $2 billion now in its budget to replace this loss. And given the restrictions of Graham Rudman, they are going to have some problems in realigning their schedule and their priorities. Challenger was one of four U.S. space shuttles, a hugely expensive machine used for both civilian and military missions. If there was a substantial delay uh, uh, in the shuttle program, it would have, a, I think, a rather serious impact on our modernization of 
of our, uh, our satellite capabilities. Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska heads the subcommittee that appropriates money to pay for military missions aboard the shuttle. One-fourth of the civilian space program, one of the four shuttles, blew up today. Is it going to be replaced? Yes. We will find a way to replace that because I, I think it's essential. And, it, and we're sort of self-insurers in that regard. But in, it is my judgment that the American public will want that uh, program to go ahead and will want to really carry out the, the program, try to attain the goals that those people on board, the seven sta uh, uh, crew members, have sacrificed their lives for now. I think that's, that's going to become even more important to us now. So, Tom, while there is a mood here to find out what happened and make sure that it doesn't happen again, I found absolutely nobody here who wanted to cut or cancel the space program. John? But, but we are really dealing in a time of almost fiscal austerity in this country, and especially in the federal government. The Challenger today cost $1.2 billion to build. It probably will cost more than that to replace. Because the program will be offline, it means that we don't have any income coming into NASA as a result of the space shuttle program. Has anyone really figured out the economic consequences of what happened here today? Well, the consequences are going to be very severe, Tom, because uh, I don't think we're looking at a, at a delay of a month or two months. We're looking at a long delay here until NASA figures out exactly what went wrong and fixes whatever it was that went wrong. But it is essential that the country continue with the space program, because remember, this is not only a civilian program, it is a military program as well. And a lot of the eggs in the military basket are riding on the space shuttle program. Now, of course, the military can use what are called expendable rockets, one-time use rockets, and get up uh, many of its satellites that way. But they also depend on the space shuttle. I'm not denying that, uh, but what I am suggesting, or John Dancy, we call him Bud, his, his name is John Dancy. I'm not, I'm not denying that, John, but what I am saying is that this just puts more pressure on the deficit, which is already considerable in terms of pressure. Uh, there is no question that it does put uh, considerable pressure on Congress, but there is also, I think, a sort of uh, philosophical question here, an image question. Will the United States pull back at this point? I don't think they will. I think, as, as Ted Stevens said, they'll find the money and go ahead somehow. All right, thanks, John Dancy at the Capitol tonight. Vice President Bush flew to Cape Canaveral early this afternoon along with Senators Jake Garn, who flew on the shuttle mission last year, and John Glenn, who, of course, was one of the early astronauts. Vice President Bush and Senators Glenn and Garn now have just arrived back at Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington, D.C. tonight. Uh, they were there to represent the president as he... Vice President Bush met with uh, members of the family. We had a very moving meeting with the families, and I don't know that I've ever been more touched because Mrs. Scobie, the wife of the commander of the flight, said she was speaking for all of the families, and that the message that she wanted to tell the Vice President and Senator Glenn and I was that the space program should go ahead. They didn't want it slowed down or stopped. And they knew that their husbands and uh, wives, families would want that too. Uh, NASA is busy with a, an investigative team already analyzing uh, what happened. They went through their plan with us before we left for uh, how they're planning to investigate the whole thing. And uh, they'll find out went wrong, what went wrong before anybody else is launched. John Glenn, who uh, went to Cape Canaveral tonight with uh, Vice President George Bush and Jake Garn, as you heard, they met with the families. The indication uh, from the senators, of course, was that uh, the families of those people who are the regular astronauts, the six members of the space crew, indicated to the vice president that they wanted this program to go on. We have our uh, correspondents uh, assorted around the country right now. Steve Delaney is at Cape Canaveral, Kennedy Space Center, and Dan Molina is at Houston, the Johnson Space Center. Robert Bazell tonight is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Bob, let's begin with you. What about the future of the space program? We have talked about that at great length all day long. As you heard John Dancy say, Congress seems determined to continue it. But do you think it will continue along the lines of putting all of its money on the shuttle program, or will they begin to diversify? Well, Tom, I think one of the things to consider is that right now there is this uh, national pride issue that John Dancy was talking about that we must go on. But I think that 
as the hard financial decisions are made, some other things might come into play. And I think one of those things is that even before this disaster, and that's the most important point, is that long before this disaster, there were questions about the shuttle program and how effective it was. And I don't think anybody was saying that we shouldn't have a manned space program and that we should abandon a manned space program. But the fact is that many of the things that the shuttle do does can be, can be done by unmanned spacecraft, and perhaps much cheaper, and perhaps certainly with uh, less threat to human life. So that those kind of considerations may well come into play when Congress begins to think about whether to appropriate that extra two billion dollars to buy another shuttle orbiter. And uh, Dan Molina, what are they saying in Houston in terms of the future of the program? All of the money continue to go into the shuttle program, or is there any talk around the edges down there, at least, of diversification of some kind? Tom, we're really not hearing anything about that here tonight. I must say, walking around here at the Johnson Space Center this evening, what I see is an amazing focus of energy. It seems like the people here at the Johnson Space Center now are attacking the biggest problem perhaps that they have ever tackled, and that's finding out what went wrong with this thing. I see this focus of professionalism, which we've come to identify with the space program, mobilizing itself this evening here. There's none of the political talk here. What there is is this mobilization of effort to try and find out what in the world went wrong. And Steve Delaney at uh, the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral tonight. What about the personal side? Down there you were mingling, as it were, as a, I guess a kind of novice yourself, watching the first shuttle launch that you have seen so far. The people who came to watch today, not only Krista McAuliffe's parents, but her husband and children, as well as uh, members of her son's third grade class were there. Are any of those people left around there, and what has been the personal reaction to what was witnessed there today? Well, I, I think we have to go back to uh, to what the senators were saying when they when Senator Garn was saying when he came back. We have not had any contact with with the uh, the members of the families, but I'd like to chip in a thought that because there was a teacher in space and because so many children around the country were watching this liftoff, it was almost their flight, their surrogate, their teacher, or somebody representing their interest was along, and it was a way to draw young people into the mystique of space to kind of make the linkage between the John Glenn era and the idea of getting out and and dealing with the idea that the future is really up there where those seven people disappeared to tonight that one of the things that will impel more movement toward finding out what went wrong and towards coping with the disaster that happened here today is to redeem the American promise the promise of space for those kids uh, to to indicate somehow to them that that it shouldn't end this way or it shouldn't it shouldn't be a setback that there is something grand and something glorious to be attained out there and that the space program almost for that reason will have to go on and will have to to redeem itself and to kind of erase what happened here today robert bazell in pasadena i want to talk with you about some of the personal side as well you knew dick scobie who was the commander of this flight in fact you had a conversation with him at one point about the possibility that something could go terribly wrong as it did today didn't you and that's that's true, Tom. We've been talking about that a lot today on many of the NBC programs. Dick Scobie was a fighter pilot. He was a test pilot. He was decorated. He had received many medals for action in Southeast Asia. And we were driving back from, from the Cape one afternoon, and he told me that uh, he thought that the, someday this would happen. He said, it, he put it very bluntly. He said, someday the shuttle's going to blow up. And I think his wife expressed what were his uh, views, what he told me this was several years ago, he said that he really wanted the shuttle program to go on, but he said that it was inevitable. It's a complex piece of machinery, it's got enough explosives in it to make it into a small bomb if something goes wrong, and that's exactly what happened today. So, I don't think to the astronauts in the program, I don't even think to the engineers in the program, that this is a terrible surprise that this happened sometime. I mean, nobody knows why it happened today. But I think that everybody thought that it was inevitable that eventually it would happen. Uh, obviously, it's a terrible setback, and nobody ever wanted it to be, but as some of the people we've talked to over the course of today have pointed out, it's a machine, and no perfect machine has ever been built. And this, when this machine went wrong, it, it caused a terrible tragedy. The fact is that it's sometimes hard to convey the commitment that the, and the dedication of the astronauts to that program. They have given up their life in many instances to, uh, to NASA, and I don't mean that in the cruelest possible form, but that is a, it's a very rigorous program in which they're engaged. They have to move to Texas in most cases. They spend long hours at what to the rest of us would be boring, even tedious tasks. Uh, they have to face disappointment. Some of these uh, people who have been in the program for a long time have not yet been in space. They've had to wait for many months, even years to go up. 
Judy Resnick was uh, one of the astronauts who died today in the explosion aboard the shuttle Challenger. She was someone that I knew relatively well because we met when uh, the first shuttle was uh, scheduled to be launched and she was assigned to NBC News as our expert commentator. And I used to talk to her about this at some length. Here was a classical pianist. She had a PhD in electrical engineering. And yet her life was absolutely given over to NASA and to the idea of being an astronaut. At the same time, she did have pretty good sense of humor. We used to have a little friendly bet from time to time about whether NASA could keep its launch schedule. And when I lost one, for a six pack, quite honestly, I sent it to her at some expense, uh, wrapped in a dozen long stem roses. And she immediately sent back the message that she loved the beer, but the roses she didn't need necessarily. So these are people who believe very strongly in the, uh, in the space program and want it to go on. In all the history of space flight, however, there never has been a disaster like the one that we witnessed today. Seven lives lost, seven families in mourning tonight, along with the rest of the nation. And as NBC's Dennis Murphy reports now, the grief is shared by the entire NASA community. Across the bay from the launch pad, Titusville, America's space town, was stunned and silent at the news. Now, close up on your left, there is the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger this morning, about 11.39 Eastern time. Offices stopped. We will not speculate as to the specific cause of the explosion. I just started crying and, and backed up and walked away because I knew it was really bad. And all of us were standing up, you know, we just couldn't believe what was going on, you know, just in total shock. It's really subdued. Um, it, it's hit this area real hard. People take it real personal. This is, this is the pride of Titusville. Titusville and the shuttle program are inseparable. Three of the five city councilmen work for NASA. The astronauts killed in 1967 are remembered in city street names. The Chamber of Commerce has an old Titan missile in the yard. The elementary school is called Apollo, and the high school is known as Astronaut. There are 14,000 people here who work in the space program, an army of specialists who put man in space. City manager Hector Figueredo. It's the same thing, the same feeling that we have here when President Kennedy was killed. And the cloud just stayed over, it's like a fireball. And Titusville has hosted tourists like Oliver and Joyce Boland from England. Terribly sad. Uh, but it, it is and does have an objective, whereas blowing people up in Libya or Vienna airport has no sense, no objective whatsoever. So I'm sure you'll go on with the space project, and I'm sure it's right you will do so. With the families, the friends, the school children who watched this morning, Titusville mourns. <laughs> Dennis Murphy, NBC News, at the Kennedy Space Center. No doubt all of America could have learned something from Krista McCullough, the high school teacher who would have brought a lesson from space home to her classroom, indeed to all of the nation's classrooms. Home for McCullough was Concord, New Hampshire. NBC's Fred Briggs traces her journey from Concord to Cape Canaveral. Concord is a small town, capital of a small state, and while too large to be the sort of place where everybody knows everybody, they at least know of everybody, all felt they knew Krista McAuliffe. She was raised in the Boston suburb of Framingham and met her future husband Stephen in high school. They both attended a state college there, then later they were married after she got her master's degree in education. They eventually moved to Concord. Krista McAuliffe was one of 11,000 who applied to be the first civilian in space. It was eventually narrowed down to 10, 10 people who got to know each other very well. And when she was chosen... When that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be 10 souls that I'm taking with me. She went through the rigorous, compressed training given to non-professionals, saw her first launch last year, couldn't quite believe it. Oh, it's beautiful! And from time to time, there were always reporters asking if she had any fear about the mission. It doesn't frighten me in the respect that they have a lot of backup systems. They don't fly the shuttle when they have something go wrong. And, and when it does go wrong, if something does go wrong, they do have the capacity to land it. Her students were elated this morning. Then the explosion, uncertainty, and silence. They were sent home from school, needed to be sent home. I felt as if uh, my whole body blew up inside when I saw that. 
Later this week, NASA was setting up a special two-way hookup between the Challenger and the school so that Mrs. McAuliffe could teach one of her classes from space. She had rehearsed for that not long ago inside the shuttle. Good morning. <clears throat> this is Kristen McAuliffe. Late today in Concord, its people were in a kind of civic and very personal shock. It's hurting all of us around Concord. We didn't know Krista personally, but we just felt like she was part of the family. I feel so sorry for the family and for actually for everybody in Concord. A memorial service was held tonight at St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church. She was a member there and was remembered tonight. She was a teacher. She was a teacher first and foremost, and she wanted to teach even from space. She will not be defeated. She will teach us, and she will teach us because of her ambition, because of her courage, because of her willingness to participate in our space program. Perhaps, but here and in much of the nation, it is a hard lesson. Fred Briggs, NBC News, Concord, New Hampshire. It has been one of those days that we would rather forget, but it's been one of those days that we'll always remember. It started, as all space launch days do, in such a festive fashion, filled with expectation and celebration. The shuttle, after all, is a kind of national symbol, and this time a pretty, perky school teacher was on board. Her parents, her husband, her children, her students, all looking on and cheering, awaiting another triumph of technology. And then, and then the explosion. Something that we have all talked about but never quite believed would happen. It was a humbling, sobering experience, a common bond, a reminder of the supreme sacrifices that others make so that we may go on to new frontiers of the human experience. NBC News will continue its coverage of the tragedy of the Challenger beginning tomorrow morning with NBC News at sunrise, followed by the Today program. For now, I'm Tom Brokaw, NBC News. Good night from all of us. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight 104%. Throttle down to 65% uh, shortly. Engines at 65%. Three engines uh, running normally. Three good fuel cells. Three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. This has been an NBC News. Tomorrow morning on Today, a complete report on the explosion without warning of the Space Shuttle Challenger. What does it mean for the future of the space program? Tomorrow morning on Today. Clear. So that people understand. Accurate. We'll be right on the money with it. Fair. I just wanted to call and check. When you need news, you need NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw.